today at the Archaeological Research Facility Bag Lunch series. Another great talk will happen. Um, we, uh, um, I'm Christine Hastorf, if you don't know me, uh, the director of the Archaeological Research Facility, and every week we have a speaker at this time and other uh, events that go on. Uh, but we do have one announcement. Where did you go, David? There you are. You were there yet last time. We have one announcement, please. For those of you who last week, sorry for the, the repeat, but there's going to be an education outreach opportunity on October 20th. Um, it's going to be about a 9.30 to 2.30 p.m. commitment. Um, it's in a town about 30, 35 miles from here. Um, just going to pass around a sign-up sheet for if you want more information. It's not that far away, so I'm trying to get the ball rolling. Um, if you signed up last week, you won't have to sign up again, but this is for people who will be coming for the first time. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have an announcement of uh, events or talks happening in the next few days? Meg? The next few days, but of course on Monday is Sonia Conley. That's right. It's the 8th. You're right. Yes, Just around the Monday. corner. Right. 2 yeah. to 4. So, yeah, right. In, in a room. Gifford room. And I've just been in touch with her to see if she's willing and interested in meeting with graduate students. This is Sonia Adelaide from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, who's done a lot of pioneering work, in, especially in indigenous and community-based participatory archaeology. And she is a Berkeley PhD, and uh, so we're very happy to have her come home. And uh, so I will be in touch through the various email lists uh, if we actually get something set up, which we're working on. Thank you. Yes, that's right. That is just around the corner. It, is Monday, it seemed right. like a long way away, and now it's here. Right, yeah. Good. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, um, I would like to introduce our uh, speaker today, uh, Todd Brocke, who is new to the Bay Area, it sounds like, which is so we're welcoming him by uh, learning about his work. He uh, got his degree at the University of Oregon, I believe, and worked up and down the coast. Uh, the West Coast, I think I could say the West Coast of North America, uh, California in particular, it, it seems like. It's certainly we're going to hear about that today. He uh, has been teaching at San Diego State, but has just this summer shifted to a job here at the Academy, California Academy of Sciences in uh, Golden Gate Park. And I'm sure many of you have been to that wonderful building there and seen the exhibits. So he is now currently the Irvine Chair of Anthropology and Associate Curator at the California Academy of Sciences right here in San Francisco. So he is a neighbor now, which is wonderful. And he uh, clearly has been working um, on uh, marine uses in archaeology of this region of the world. And we're going to hear about a really wonderful and mysterious, at least to me, um, item, and that is abalone. So he's going to tell us about his recent research on shellfish um, in the title, Shellfish for the Celestial Empire, wonderful name, A Deep History of the Birth, Collapse, and Future of California Abalone Fishing. So thank you very much, Todd, for coming. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Well, it, it's great to be here, so thanks for the, the, the great introduction and the invitation. Um, if, if you don't know, that Alfred Krobier was our first curator of anthropology at, at the Cal Academy. Uh, you stole him away from us after only a couple of years. He was hired in 1900. Um, and so it's, it, it, uh, we've had a long uh, relationship with Berkeley, and one of the things that I'd like to do with my position is continue that and make that even stronger. So I, you know, I'd welcome all of you or any of you um, to, to email me to, um, if we have wonderful collections, we have wonderful uh, folks at Cal Academy, and I, there, there's lots of interactions and collaborations we can have. Um, and so, so please, part of me being here is hopefully we can explore some of that, uh, students and faculty and, and everyone in between. Um, you're not allowed to tell anyone, but as I was driving here, I'm, I'm swearing you all the secrecy, in, including the people watching uh, on video. Uh, this is, I think, my 25th anniversary of my rejection letter from UC Berkeley. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very proud to be invited back, invited here to give a talk. Um, and so, uh, 
All right, so I'm, I'm going to sort of talk to you about some of the, the research that I've been doing recently on the Channel Islands, in particular on California abalone. And I, and I went to do my graduate work at the University of Oregon uh, to work on issues of historical ecology, and I was very focused on the prehistoric archaeology of, of coastal California, and particularly the Channel Islands. And as I was doing my research, I kept running into these sites. Uh, and every archaeologist, besides Mike Glassow in the 1980s, who recorded two of these site types, walked right past them because they are the most seemingly boring sites on the islands, right? They're just piles of mostly large, whole and broken black abalone shells, and they tend to be nothing else. Um, and these were created in, um, in the mid-19th century. And as I would walk past these at first as well, as I focused on, and, and you have to forgive myself and many other archaeologists in the Channel Islands, if, if you record every site or you stop to look at every site that you walk past, you'll never get anything done. You'll never accomplish your, your research goals. There are just thousands of sites, uh, still many unrecorded, many unsampled. Um, and these were just ones that we tended to walk by. But then I started to realize this was a really important part of the historical ecology of coastal California and filled in a major gap in our understanding of human marine interactions through deep time. So these sites were created uh, in the mid 19th century by immigrant Chinese abalone fishers who came over during the California gold rush. And you probably all know parts of this story of, uh, that, that centers out of San Francisco about the, uh, the, the rise of the gold rush, the flood of California above immigrant populations around the world uh, coming to California and San Francisco in particular, and then the, the contributions of Chinese immigrants to many industries in California, like Chinese laundries and railroad labor and gold mining and, and sort of uh, important historic families that we've learned a lot about the, the immigrant Chinese experience in, in 19th and 20th century California. And uh, part of this history too, and one that's not really told as widely, is the history of the first commercial abalone fishing that Chinese immigrants uh, developed uh, at, shortly after they arrived uh, during the California <laughs> Gold Rush. So I work on this story. I, w I work mostly in the, the Northern Channel Islands. You've, you, the, you've, you probably are all familiar. Four offshore islands, Anacapa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, San Miguel, just north of LA, off of Santa Barbara, uh, in Alta, California. And I was focused on the prehistoric history because the prehistoric history is really celebrated on these islands. We have some of the oldest archeological sites uh, along the New World Coast. This is Arlington Springs a set of human remains that was found in 1959, I believe, in the 1950s by Phil Orr at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, uh, recently redated to uh, 13,000 years by John Johnson and, and uh, Shumash representatives as well, uh, making it some of the oldest human remains uh, found in North America and certainly uh, along our coastlines. And then uh, uh, we've been filling in this gap. So this, you know, this was human remains and not much else. And we filled in the gaps on the Channel Islands to in, in the last 10 years or so, um, showing uh, some of these earliest paleo-coastal peoples were using sophisticated stem point technology, crescent technology, doing things like hunting uh, snow and, and uh, Canada goose. Uh, 12,000 years ago, Chen deities, a now extinct form of flightless duck. Um, and so we've, we've learned an incredible amount about the, the early colonization and uh, the history of these, uh, the, the earliest peoples on these islands. And in fact, the islands are this incredible place. This is probably one of my, my favorite spots on all the islands. This is on San Miguel Island, on northwest San Miguel Island, uh, Otter Point. Uh, a massive dune complex. Each of these little lines is a, is a shell midden that was built at the top of the dune and occupied for some, in, uh, some interval. And if you add all these together, this is 7,000 years of human history in this one spot, but also ecological history. 
of, of people interacting with these marine environments. Just to give you some scale, there's two people standing at the top of this dune, right? So just really majestic place. Uh, and we know from this rich archaeological record that extends continuously from at least 13,000 years all the way up to uh, uh, European contact, evolution of hunting technologies, fishing technologies, boating technologies, and uh, you know, it, it, if you if you studied much and, and if you know about the record in, in coastal California and California in general, sort of the, the entire history of the islands really could be told in my hand here, right? So these are purple olive snail shells that were made into to beads and ornaments starting at least 10,000 years ago and then evolved into a sophisticated shell money bead network. Uh, breaking up the beads, using chert drills to grind them into money beads. Each bead had a value that was standardized, or at least each string of beads had a value that was standardized, and these were traded all over the American West, down into Mexico, Central Oregon, and, and certainly all over California, right? So this development of a sophisticated socio-political uh, uh, shell bead trading network on the islands. Uh, and again, this rich history. And then we have uh, that all sort of uh, fundamentally changed with the establishment of the mission period and, and starting in 1769 uh, and, and, and prior to this with contacts by Cabrillo in the 16th century. Um, but missionization certainly uh, by 1822 caused the abandonment or uh, the removal of Chumash peoples uh, from their islands, the, 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 the fundamental change of, of these uh, indigenous lifeways um, and, and the establishment of the mission period um, in, in, in the historic period. And the islands then converted from uh, Chumash uh, hunting and gathering homes uh, to ranching outposts. And, and this is a, you know, these stories are well known. If you work on the Channel Islands, there's this cast of, of ranching characters as the islands were converted into cattle and sheep uh, and, and pig and, and uh, deer and elk hunting centers uh, in the mid 19th and, and through the 20th century. The Lester family uh, called himself that the, the the king of San Miguel Island, here's his ranch complex on, on San Miguel. Um, and uh, again, this sort of changed the ecology and, uh, of the islands and is sort of emblematic or, or, or looms large in the history and, and evolution of these ecosystems. And at the same time, uh, the, the marine systems were changing fundamentally too as the terrestrial systems around the islands were, were being changed by the introduction of these domestic animals and wild animals. Uh, of course, in the historic period, the, the, the uh, sea otter hunting uh, depleted uh, uh, North Pacific ecosystems of this prime predator of, and, and uh, apex predator uh, throughout much of its range. Uh, the, 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 uh, the hunting for its pelts and, and uh, uh, trade network that developed out of that uh, caused this commercial hunting of the seas as we had the commercialization of the, uh, of the islands itself with the ranching period. I characterize this as like the sea of slaughter, right? This was the time in the 18th and 19th century that cetaceans, sea mammals were uh, driven to the brink of extinction uh, as this insatiable um, hunt for their pelts and blubber and, and other materials ramped up. And just to give you some scale of this, right, otters were, were quickly depleted out of North Pacific uh, uh, systems. And it was this commercial trade of otters that connected the Pacific Rim with uh, these markets in Canton. And as pot otter pelts declined and became harder to find and harder to get, the prices just skyrocketed, right? So this market system where Rarity should allow those animals to, uh, the, the, uh, in, in a sort of hunting and gathering situation, would allow those animals to recover. The market system just drove them to the brink of extinction, right? And it was only a small group of, of otters in the remote Big Sur coast that they couldn't be accessed or weren't found. 
that has helped reestablish populations in some of their ranges around the Pacific. Right? So these ecosystems changes led to a, to a, a, a number of, of consequences in marine systems. And one of those consequences, that the taking out of the two primary predators of abalone, humans, coastal indigenous populations that, that, that were hunting and, and harvesting abalone, and the removal of otters from the system that, that are voracious predators of abalone, allowed populations to just explode around California, right? And so here's some pictures from Santa Cruz Island of black abalone, which is an intertidal species growing one on top of the other in just unseen you know, densities, of stuff that we've never seen, at least in the Holocene, right? Really large, one on top of the other, and just these incredible densities as they were released from predation pressure. So this is the scene that was set uh, in 1848 when gold was discovered in Sutter's Mill uh, in, in, in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. And of course, this sparked the California gold rush and uh, uh, miners from, from fortune seekers from all over the world flooded San Francisco to, to, to find their fortunes uh, in, the, in the foothills of, of California and more broadly the American West. This included 116,000 Chinese immigrants between 1848 and 1876 uh, as the single largest group of uh, immigrants to, to make their way to San Francisco and California during the California Gold Rush. And so some idea of this, um, uh, of this, this uh, mass immigration to California. And I put this picture up because at least initially, everyone was working for the same goal. And, and while there were tensions, uh, here's a, a photo of white and Chinese miners working together in 1852. Uh, race relations, relations between groups seeking their fortunes was at least um, uh, not hostile. But it didn't take long for the mother load to dry up, dry up and tensions to rise and white miners to become frustrated with uh, immigrant populations that were stealing the wealth of California and exporting it to families overseas uh, and, um, and blaming uh, uh, immigrants for things like depressed wages as that initial ban gold bonanza dried up. Uh, and because of that unrest, right, uh, and, 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 and uh, the, the government of California, state governments, uh, uh, started issuing um, uh, taxes, targeted racist, targeted taxes on Chinese and other immigrant miners, although um, it was for immigrant miners, but really many of these taxes and fees targeted immigrant Chinese populations. They were easy to identify. They were easy to blame. And so thing like, things like the foreign miners license imposed a $20 tax per month on all foreign miners. And while uh, Chinese miners were only uh, a, a part of the foreign miner group in California, they took the brunt of the taxes. And it was taxes and targeted legislation like this that famously drove Chinese immigrants to the, to the economic and geographic margins of California for jobs as cooks, laundry workers, servants, as they could no longer, or as many of them found it too difficult um, uh, and too many roadblocks to make a living uh, in the California gold industry. And of course, you, you probably know this, this led to uh, uh, immigrants, Chinese immigrants, to recognize the untapped potential along our coast. While everyone in California was uh, sort of blinded by yellow fever, gold fever, um, the gold haze, um, uh, the resources along our coast were, were, were left untapped. So famously, Chinese immigrants slid into this industry. Many of these immigrants, the vast majority of them, came from Guangdong province, a coastal province in, uh, in China. They probably had the tools, the knowledge, the ability to access these resources. And so here's a, a squid 
drying a, a, a squid processing camp in Monterey in 1886. And one of the, uh, uh, so you hear about squid, you hear about the Chinese uh, shrimp industry. One, one you may not have heard of is Chinese immigrants were the first to recognize the untapped potential of these hyperabundant abalone in California. So the first commercial abalone fisheries pop up in the 1850s. The earliest we have is in 1853 in Monterey. The first on the islands, at least documented in, in historic newspaper accounts, 1856. And here's a, an account from the Los Angeles Star in 1861. The extent and importance of our coast fisheries are not, we think, generally known or appreciated. A very large business is being carried on in this department along the coast and the islands and the channel from Santa Barbara down. We are not agreeably surprised to find the number of men and vessels engaged in our fishery, as well as the capital expended in fitting out the same. Chinese fishermen are not limited to any particular kind of fishing, taking a large quantity of abalones. So these uninteresting sites on the island, they're, they're, I find them quite interesting now, right? Um, and have spent 10 years looking at them, are the records of these first, the birth of commercial uh, abalone fishing in California. And what they are are mostly thin layers of black abalone shells built in historic dune sands um, along rocky intertidal shorelines. They're relatively small. They seem to be logistical, short-term, highly specialized uh, foraging camps where Chinese immigrants were dropped off on the Channel Islands, stayed out for three months at a time, and systematically harvested abalone up and down the, uh, the coast of, of the Northern Islands. And, and much of coastal California that's been, the record has been wiped out by erosion, by development, by Walmarts and, and McMansions right on the coast. Uh, but this record has le been left uh, largely intact on the Channel Islands. I've spent the last 10 years with students, we just finished up much of this work, uh, trying to identify these sites uh, and document these sites along the island. And again, they tend to be these, these small logistical foraging camps that don't have much else in them as people were walking along the coast. Now that's not always true. Right? Uh, a few sites have things like brownstoneware pottery, uh, evidence of, of these fishermen bringing out with them things like uh, pickled vegetables, soy sauce, uh, wine, and uh, all the foodstuffs that they would need to survive on the island. I've always found this quite strange. These were expert fishermen. and We have no evidence that they were actually doing any fishing other than for abalone. Uh, and bringing out everything they needed uh, in these brown stoneware pottery and, and, and historical counts of sacks of rice and things. We also have uh, evidence of uh, you know, things like spice bottles, but perhaps more interesting, here's something I stole off the internet, right? This is an opium glass lamp, or this is an opium lamp. Uh, we have the glass of, of, from some of these opium lamps at uh, certain sites, a few sites around the Channel Islands. Again, sort of passing the, the, the time as you're out there for three months at a time um, and in the evenings, perhaps, um, as part of uh, uh, these, these uh, fishing expeditions. And then uh, perhaps some of my favorite, we, we think these, we, we can't be 100% confident they're associated with Chinese fishermen, but these emblematic uh, stellar sea lion rings, and we have the whole sequence found from western San Miguel Island, the, the, the canines themselves, the sawn bits or, or uh, blanks uh, created, and then the, 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 uh, the ground and polished ivory rings that were being made here, a couple cracked and discarded on the islands. Again, perhaps a way to pass the time uh, in these fishing camps. Right, and so some of these sites seem to be places where uh, uh, schooners and steamers were dropping Chinese fishermen off at central locations, and then they would walk along the, chan al along the islands, harvesting black abalone, drying them, and bringing them back to, to, to central locations for processing and shipment to the mainland 
and then ultimately uh, much of it overseas, right? So this commercial industry starts to ramp up. So here's, uh, there's a number of different descriptions of how this fishing happened. Uh, here's one of them. They, they, they're all largely similar, similar, just to give you some idea. It's from 1871, San Diego Union. The abalone is found attached to rocks in extreme low tide, the greater quantities than, than any other time. The fish, covered by dense shell, adheres to the rock as tightly as if glued and is cut loose with a sharp implement. After filling a large bag with meat, which is removed from the shell, it is carried to the uh, place chosen to dry it and receives a good pounding. After this beating, the meat is thrown into a large kettle and boiled for a short time. It is then spread out in the sun to dry. After a thorough drying, it is nicely packed in strong sacks, shipped to San Diego or Santa Barbara, where local markets, to be reshipped from here to Chinese merchants in San Francisco. The meat commands in that city from five to six cents per pound and is used exclusively by the Chinese. A considerable quantity is shipped to China, where it is regarded as a great luxury, only being used by the better class of society. So one of the reasons abalone was largely ignored is it was seen by white Americans, white Californians, as inedible, right? It wasn't a, a, a resource. And uh, it was consumed almost exclusively um, in Chinatowns by immigrant Chinese communities and then shipped overseas where the abalone market had been overfished in mainland China and it dried up and they were getting quite uh, robust prices in these overseas markets and developing this trans-Pacific uh, industry for abalone. And these central locations then they were dropped off and there were places where abalone could be processed, packed up, and then ships could come to, uh, to, to pick up the load and, and the fishermen and bring them back to the mainland uh, for their journey um, uh, to, to, to local consumption or overseas consumption. So here on Western uh, San Miguel, this is Point Bennett. Um, here we, we found one of these central locations, a hearth feature, an abalone pavement of, of both reds and blacks, but primarily black abalone. And then uh, a, a couple features, these sort of horseshoe-shaped or U-shaped hearth features. You can see them here. There's a, a remnant of probably one of these cleaned out. Uh, and then a picture here kind of describing this. Parties of Chinese fishermen were on the various Channel Islands most of the year. Rogers and brothers of the city sent out today for San Miguel a party of five men for abalone, seal skins, and oil. The number of abalone to be attained by such a party is impossible to estimate. Low tide being the only time when they can be gathered. At the lower tide, the more there are exposed to view. And so these vast tanks were probably taken out. Abalone boiled and dried, packed up, and then brought back uh, to mainland markets. And in fact, uh, these horseshoe-shaped hearth features, uh, we see as a, 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 they are... Um, uh, they are emblematic of Chinese camps. We see them in the mining industry as well. Here's one depicted back here. Uh, and a part of the way that, that um, Chinese immigrants were, were, were constructing hearth features uh, all over California at the time. Uh, and in the fact, it wasn't just abalone meat that was being pounded and processed. A uh, commercial industry for the shell developed as well for lacquerware for overseas, for lime for construction purposes, for decoration for inlay purposes. And when the shell was valuable, when the market was good, they would ship the shell back to the mainland and then overseas as well. When the market dove and, and, and it wasn't profitable, they would leave it, on, stockpile the shells on the islands and then re-harvest that stuff later, come back and, and harvest that stuff later. Just to give you some scale, one of my graduate students at, at San Diego State did a lot of work in historic records trying to look at the scale of, of this industry. And it was, uh, for both the meat and the shells, it was an incredible industry. And at times, the shell even outvalued the meat. Uh, abalone drying racks from Baja, California. We even have the remnants of these on the islands, uh, the, the racks themselves, the stakes that were probably made uh, to construct these drying racks uh, on the islands. So Chinese immigrants built this industry 
They built a trans-Pacific commercial trade for shells and meat, uh, and they controlled this industry for at least two decades in California, right? For the slow-growing, intertidal black abalone. They weren't going for other abalone species that were subtidal uh, because they didn't have diving equipment, right? So it was gathering during low tides for intertidal black. Uh, and they ranged up and down the coast across the Channel Islands harvesting this material, right, this, this industry. Well, things really rapidly changed beginning in the 1870s. Uh, and this an, an anti-Chinese sentiment started to reach a, a fever pitch in California. Again, many of you are probably familiar with this story. But it, ironically, this happened because we solved two of our biggest problems. One, the ending of the Civil War that caused this uh, market, this labor to, to flood the market and economic depression, and then economic depression in California because of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, right? So once the railroad was, was completed, it was supposed to bring cheap goods to California, create a market for goods in California back to the East Coast, and what it did is it allowed, at least initially, for well-established factories along the East Coast to ship their cheap goods to California, or their, their less cheap goods, their less expensive goods to California uh, and, and undermine the market and then allowed that labor to make it out to California, right? So we had this labor crisis in California and this spawned the, uh, uh, partly uh, the, the, these two uh, success stories uh, in, in the United States uh, spawned or, or helped grow this anti-Chinese sentiment that really reached a fever pitch with the establishment of the Working Men's Party uh, in the 1870s. Its leader was Dennis Kearney, who was a failed gold miner uh, and an Irish immigrant himself, an immigrant himself, uh, an Irish immigrant, uh, who took to ending many of his speeches around California that raged about uh, labor and government overstep and uh, the lack of, of, of resources for, for working peoples throughout the country to, uh, they, he took to ending his uh, speeches with the Chinese must go, right? Blaming, clearly blaming Chinese immigrants and sort of propaganda that was popping up all over California and the state. So it, it didn't take long for federal and state lawmakers to, to, to listen to uh, this growing anti-Chinese sentiment. And then in 1882, the, uh, perhaps one of the biggest black eyes in, in, uh, in our history uh, uh, was established with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. This started 60 years of state and federal sponsored racism in the United States, and, it, and the act excluded skilled and unskilled laborers and Chinese employed in mining from entering the United States. Two years later, with Article 14, no court or court of the United States shall admit Chinese to citizenship. Again, this state-sponsored racism that wasn't repealed until 1943, right? As we blame Chinese, uh, Chinese immigrants for the uh, for the economic woes of our country uh, and California in particular. So uh, uh, an increasing series of, of legislations then were targeted at Chinese immigrants in many industries, and in particular the uh, 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 industries like the, the fishing industry in, in California, the Scott Act of 1882, Revised Exclusion Act of 1890, that made it very difficult to uh, for Chinese immigrants to make a living uh, in these fisheries that they established in California, including abalone fishery. Uh, so this really, by 1880, this really marks the end or the, the rapid decline of Chinese ownership in this industry, in this commercial industry, restricting ownership of Chinese junk vessels, re-entry into American ports, the collection of abalone, this series of legislation that were targeted at basically removing uh, uh, Chinese fishermen from the industry. In fact, California Department of Fish and Game uh, admitted as such that these laws were designed to save California abalone from, quote, 
thoroughgoing Chinamen with their usual lack of foresight, right? That they were taking abalone and other resources with total disregard for, uh, for its, it, its uh, conservation. So once Chinese immigrants were sort of legislated out of the industry uh, and at the same time uh, other groups were recognizing its potential, uh, Japanese and Euro-American divers sort of expanded the abalone industry to not only include black abalone, but its subtitle species as well, like red, pink, green, and white abalone. Uh, we have some record of that on the Channel Islands here off San Miguel, uh, probably right off that, that same spot that I showed you earlier with those hearth features and Japanese ceramics. Here's a hard hat diving outfit, Japanese diving outfit. Again, sort of flooding that industry in the late 19th century. Well, Californians at large, like, uh, really were introduced to the joys of abalone in 1915, right? With the California Exposition right here in San Francisco, this was to celebrate the completion of the Panama Canal, which incidentally was completed earlier than planned. Does that ever happen? <laughs> Uh, and it was, it was sort of the San Francisco and California celebration of California, right? Everything that California had to offer to the United States and the world. It included a 1,300-seat dining hall with 350 varieties of local seafood to sort of educate uh, California and, and the wider United States on marine resources. They produced a cookbook, and though it wasn't in the cookbook, uh, one of the things they did at the fair was educate people on how to cook and prepare abalone, right? You have to pound it. The way you, you, you cook it becomes important so it doesn't turn into shoe leather, right? And, um, and sort of celebrating uh, the, the joys of, of, of abalone. This really sparked a wider interest not only in local consumption but in the commercial fishery of abalone, and at this point, Euro-Americans really entered into the fishery and, start, and abalone started to be consumed by a, a, a wider uh, community uh, throughout the state and throughout the country. Uh, in 1913, the U.S. government passed the Alien Lands Law. It prohibited, quote, aliens ineligible for citizenship from owning, owning land or property and basically handed control of the abalone industry over to Euro-Americans. Right? And this was the coup de grace and uh, really was the end of, of, of the Chinese fishery for abalone in California. And at this time, we start to see abalone pop up along California and New York and other places on bills of fare, on menus. Right? So things like abalone chowder <coughs> first start to show up in 1916, abalone steak in 1923. This stuff is really cool because you start to look through it cost 60 cents for a uh, fried abalone steak, which is about 650 in today's currency, you'd need an extra $50 probably to have that meal today, right? Um, so it, it becomes this, this uh, cuisine of a, of a wide populace, right? And uh, the industry then ramps up and becomes not just a, a commercial industry that's largely shipped overseas, Seas, but a locally consumed industry, and we have things like the Pierce Brothers. This is a um, abalone processing shop out of Santa Barbara, 1933, with their mountain of abalone shells. Right, um, uh, enter into this commercial industry, and the commercial harvest really ramps up. And by the 1920s, we start to have this fluctuation and, and, and fits and spurts. Right, that that abalone. Uh, production really or uh, fishing ramps up. There's a decline in the population. Uh, there's a decline in the fishery because of, of slow regrowth rates and, and, and impacts on healthy beds. And so this boom and bust industry starts to, to, to cycle through coastal California. And one of the things that I got really interested in was, well, is there something we can say about the legislation out of Chinese fishermen? They spent several decades as the prime fishers of black abalone in California of a slow-growing intertidal mollusk, right? That they were shipping overseas, much of it overseas, to China. So was their legislation out, conservation, 
are part of a racist anti-Chinese sediment in California and throughout the United States. So again, the real purpose of the law is aimed at the Japanese and Chinese principally who are taking them by the ton without regard to size, removing the meat from the shell in the water and bringing it ashore, right? So they're trying to circumvent laws, conservation laws, and uh, they were, if, we, if, if California let this industry continue, it would have, it would have collapsed, right? Well, that record of that industry is still on the island. So we've measured something like 1,400 black abalone shells, length measurements, and here's the distribution from all those sites around the Channel Islands. All right, now bear with me a minute. Um, the, the 1910, 1911, the, the minimum size limit was 97 millimeters, right? 9.6 or below this limit. The mean is 125.8 millimeters, right? Now, a juvenile abalone is defined, a non-reproductive juvenile abalone is any abalone below 50 millimeters. There's only two in all these sites that we've measured, right? 0.1% are juveniles. Uh, and only 162 uh, uh, measurements are double the size of the largest juvenile. Did I say that right? right? I think I did, right? Less than 100 millimeters, double size the smallest adult or largest juvenile, right? Does this sound like uh, they're over-harvesting abalone? It doesn't to me, right? And we can argue why this is, and I got a really kind of a review on my book that I didn't really agree, <laughs> where I put this story down. But one is it could be market, right? It, it, this could be part of the market economy. You want large abalone steaks and large abalone shells to ship overseas. This is also can be conservation, right? You bypass juveniles and only take adults uh, so the juveniles can grow up to be adults as you make those rounds around the island and up and down the coast. Does it matter whether it was the market or intentional con conservation? I don't think it does. I think the end product is there was some management, whether it was the market that was managing this or Chinese fishermen who were managing this. And I have to believe since the, uh, uh, the market in China was overfished and collapsed, for abalone in China, they had seen the consequences of that, and they were living at a time where they couldn't own land, they couldn't work on public projects, they couldn't be employed by the state because of all this targeted legislation. This was one of the last, the fisheries were one of the last places that Chinese immigrants could make a living. It just makes a lot of sense that they tried to take care of it and tried to maintain that fishery. So we can get into all that. That, that becomes really interesting. But, but uh, you know, I'll do some more to convince you here. This, these are the size, uh, the average size of, of black abalone uh, at Chinese sites. Again, no otters, right? So there's ecological changes that have happened in the historic period compared to the prehistoric. But this is the Shumash fishery for black abalone, right? And then here are the 1910 to 1911 size restrictions. Really different. Right, so uh, with otters in the system and with a shoe mash harvest uh, throughout the Holocene, right? So again, this kind of seems like, cons this seems like conservation to me uh, and, and it seems like there was some work to maintain this fishery. Uh, and so, um, what was I gonna say here? Oh, I was gonna say that, um, uh, that again, that the state and uh, the federal government pitched this as something they had to do to protect and maintain abalone fisheries in California. And because they did it, their laws, their size restrictions, their bag limits, their closures during seasons would help maintain a healthy abalone fishery into the future, right? And so we can look at sort of the, the, the that, you know, seemed to be the case for a while, right? Uh, Chinese uh, immigrants were, were um, 
while there was booms and busts, once the Chinese immigrants were, were removed from the fishery, the fishery seemed to grow. There was a lull as, as um, restrictions were put in place and then ramped up again after World War II and a need for meat and canned abalone uh, ramped up. Uh, but the, the focus of the industry sort of changed from red abalone early and, and red and pink late. But what was happening, what seemed to be stability in the fishery actually was serial collapse. If we look at what was being fished when, what we see is that uh, fishermen and, and generally this new European commercial fish, uh, fishing industry would go after one species. Once that species was depleted, they would change their target to another species to make up that decline and just start adding in until the entire system collapsed. And just like otters, when uh, abalone became harder to get, less available, uh, the price for abalone, as we've tracked in menus, just skyrockets, right? So again, bringing this uh, fishery to the absolute brink of collapse by the 1880s and 1890s, when withering foot syndrome swept through populations of black abalone and other abalone in California and caused a fundamental collapse or combined with overfishing to, to, to cause the, the fundamental collapse of abalone populations around California. And withering foot syndrome is a, a, a bacterial infection that basically causes the abalone to eat itself, fall off the rock, and then be consumed by predators or just wither and, and, and die, right? And so today, if you want to eat abalone at some fancy restaurant here in San Francisco, you're not eating wild abalone. You're eating abalone from one of about a dozen abalone farms where they grow abalone in tanks, generally red abalone, uh, along the central California coast. And so in, in 1993, uh, because of the collapse of, of California abalone, and black in particular, all commercial and sport fishing of black abalone was closed, right? And it was listed as a species of concern. And uh, after 20 years of management, protection, no fishing, and very little predation by otters, because they haven't reestablished in, in, in much of their range throughout California, things have only gotten worse. And we've upgraded black abalone from a species of concern to endangered. And if you know anything about the ESA, that's really hard to do. Things have to be really bad. So 20 plus years of management uh, and things have only gotten worse. Well, a uh, part of the management plan, it's sort of a three-pronged approach to, to, to help abalone recovery. But one of the primary uh, ways that, that uh, California Fishing Game is, is trying to help abalone recover in California is to reseed populations which means you grow millions of juvenile abalone in tanks, you take them out to locations, and you reseed them along rocky intertidal shores where they might take hold and then build populations over wider space, right? And, and through time and, and into these optimal habitats. And in the California Fish and Game Plan, this is what they listed. One of the best places to do this for black abalone is on the Channel Islands, and they identified 100% of Miguel, 60 Rosa, 100 Anacapa, and here are all the numbers of these shorelines as prime black abalone optimal habitat. And my thought was, can't we do better than this? 100% of the shoreline on San Miguel is great for abalone reseeding, black abalone reseeding. Is there something the archaeological record can tell us about how to better manage uh, populations and rebuild this fishery? Well, part of the problem that I see and many marine ecologists have, have pointed out for a couple decades now is that we tend to base our management uh, in marine systems and fisheries on records that only go back 50, maybe 100 years, but recent records, right, because of the quality of data, because of the resolution, because of the new standards, but it tends to be based on records that already have seen exceptional exploitation by commercial fisheries. And here, this grainy photo right out of the California Fishing Game Management Plan, this is kind of how they're basing it on, right? 
This is the record of uh, dive harvest from 1950 to 1993 along the Channel Islands, showing Miguel was a, a great place and then these other places as we go, right? So they base it on where stuff was in the mid 20th century after at least 100 years of commercial exploitation of Nova fishing. So here it is. There's the, the dive harvest, uh, 1915 to 1993. But again, what if we put the archaeological record on top of this? So we look at Shumash fishing for black abalone. Well, we get, uh, we just kind of set up some standard of, okay, what archaeological sites have 10% black abalone shell in them? Right? Here they are, 11 to 14%, 15 to 25 26 to 80. What does this look like? Where the modern record of fishing is, the archaeological record seems to sort of jive with this, right? We can actually add then the record of, of uh, Chinese uh, uh, fishing industry on top of this and zero into targets on where abalone what have, has been productive, where abalone, black abalone fisheries have been productive for 10,000 years. So a really simple application, like I, I understand this is a totally simple historical ecology application, but these areas are places where abalone have been, black abalone have done well for 10,000 years, seem to be available to fishers for 10,000 years, and places where they've weathered changes in sea surface temperatures from cold to warm temperatures through time. So if we're going to reseed, why not start there? The reality is it took me three different journals and five different rounds of reviews to get that paper published, right? And so there is this disconnect between um, what ecologists and managers think are, are, are good data for restoration and conservation and what historical ecologists think um, the ways in which it can be applied. So, uh, um, so we have a lot of work to do. I, I guess I'll leave it at that. All right, so conclusions. Um, this narrative of Chinese abalone fishing in, in Southern California can, can it, it, to me, it's really, it's a, it's a broader history of immigrants in this country, their struggles, their successes, the unique and, and uncelebrated many times ways and they contributed to our national identity. Uh, in, in 1950, if any of you remember, uh, 1950 you could go to a burger shack after you're done fishing on the California coast and grab an abalone burger for a couple of bucks. Until the collapse and the closure, abalone was an emblematic part of this state and that was founded by Chinese immigrants, right? And so in the, the, the unique ways that they shaped our nation, often in the face of racism uh, and, and, uh, uh, and anti-immigration uh, sentiments. And the story continues. Our national debate is, uh, has shifted a little bit recently, uh, but I'm sure we're gonna get back to this uh, debate about immigration. Uh, we need to start applying these lessons, right? Of course, the irony of, of, of Dennis Kearney and his working men's group is that just three decades prior, five decades prior, you could find uh, uh, signs in local businesses that said Nina, no Irish need apply. They were the immigrant en enemies to this country. Uh, and his ancestors, he was the immigrant en enemy. And it just shifted to Chinese immigrants. Uh, by the 1850s, right? And the story continues. So the key to restoring these degraded uh, ecosystems, marine ecosystems, saving abalone and other fisheries may be by looking to the past. There are lessons that we can learn from the past. They can often be very simple uh, and, and very straightforward if we're willing to pay attention. Archaeology matters, history matters, not just because it's, it's interesting stories about what happened to the past, but they tell us about why we are at the place we are today and where we want to go in the future. And still, uh, we base our restoration science on this country 
on the best available science. We, we are mandated to apply the best available science. Nowhere is archaeology listed as part of the best available science for conservation uh, management uh, in this country. And that needs to change. All right, thanks. I'll take any questions. Yes. Hi. Hi. That was fantastic. Thank you. I look forward to your later plan and asking you some questions. Great. Yeah. But just one thing to think about in terms of, of representation of the opium. Mm -hmm. One of the things that struck me listening to your talk is how much retentive stress injuries people are probably discovered mm -hmm. being in salt water for an extended period of time. Yeah. That there's probably more than just a recreational aspect. Of it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But it's a. Uh, you know, it's it's yeah. I mean, there's there's great. It's such a, it's such a, you do such a wonderful job talking about the yeah. racialized context, and opium becomes one of those. People Those think, yeah. Points. People grab onto that and think, oh, these are these are they they demonize this, right? Yeah. That they're this sort is a, a, an addiction, right? Focusing and on the sort of the medicinal aspect yeah. of opium, that, that yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't cover that. I do cover that in my book. That it it is um, opium. I mean, it was a way to relieve the stresses of. Oh, of, of I mean, yeah. We're having Right, and we, we do that today in a different form, right? We do that today in a different form, yeah. And, yeah. and in fact, like, Euro-America at the same time was consuming more opiates than, than immigrant Chinese communities were. It was just in different forms. And these, like, medicines and, right, that, that were filled with opiates, absolutely. Yes? Thank you, I'm curious, uh, I know that uh, butchery patterns, cut marks on uh, auto remains are one of the things that can associate uh, certain remains with traditional practices. Yeah. And in California, that's been applied to auto remains from Chinese sites. I don't know this, but is there anything about abalone harvesting that would leave a distinct trace if it was done in a manner that uh, was practiced by yeah. people who were part of the Chinese diaspora as yeah. opposed to the, the later harvesting? Yeah. Um, well, that's a great question, and and unfortunately, there's not right. There 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 are no butchery marks on abalone shell that that would be distinctive. Um, and many of these sites are just piles of black abalone. Like that, like 90% of them, 95% of them are just piles of black abalone shell. And when I first started publishing about these sites, that was one of the re the reviews that I would often get. I'd be like, how do you know these are Chinese immigrants? Well, one we know because uh, once the Chinese were out of the industry, uh, it expanded to other species, and black abalone weren't weren't the, the, the focus of the harvest. Um, and so we know, we know because of that, we know their contacts, and we know because I did something uh, that I, I gave a presentation on it at, at a conference, and everyone laughed at me, and I laughed at myself, uh, but I ran five radiocarbon dates on different sites, different of these Chinese abalone sites, just to show that I wouldn't get a date, right? Because they're not old enough to, to, to register a radiocarbon date. So it didn't produce a date, which I was like, well, there you go, right? They're not, they're not Native American, right? And we know they're not post-Chinese because uh, the focus was then on subtitle species diving. And in fact, that post-Chinese industry really doesn't show up in the archeological record because the shell, it was done largely from boats and the shell and the meat were being shipped straight off. So it was never cached on the island in any way. So um, I think we've got that dialed in and it only cost me $1,200 to, uh, to demonstrate that, but it was worth it. I gotta... Yes. 
there conflicts between people who are trying to reseed abalone populations and people who are trying to enhance kelp forest populations? It seems as a yeah. kind of two-sided issue. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the bigger contention right now is between folks who want to reintroduce and, and uh, expand sea otter populations and, and people who want to rebuild the abalone fishery. Right. And so I've engaged with managers. I have them on papers. I'm, I'm tied in with the formal commercial abalone divers who are really passionate. This was their way of life till not very long ago. Their parents were doing this um, and they want to see that industry come back. And I, I don't have any easy answers. But one of the things that I look at is that the Shumash were able to harvest abalone intensively hunt otters, not drive them to extinction, uh, and, and, and make that whole system work. But it was a completely different marine system that was much healthier. So if we get back there, I think we can have both. We can have abalone, we can have healthy kelp forests, and we can have, a, uh, and we can have otters. But we probably can't have a commercial fishery that feeds the world, right? It's probably gonna be a local fishery as it was for much of the Holocene. Um, and that commercial fishery, the fishery that these commercial uh, abalone divers were, were, are used to is a, is a historical anomaly, right? It, it was because otters were driven to extinction. It's because people were taken out of the system. It was like, it, it's, a, it's a system of dysfunction. And so we have to put it back together uh, and that's gonna take a really long time, but I, I think we can, we can do it. It can happen. Um, and of course it's complicated by, rising ocean temperatures and acidification and all the problems but you know i i, I do think that there is a path forward but we need to to heed the lessons of history right and, and how we do that thank you very much thank you thanks